Introducing the extraordinary ancient kingdom of Laos audio CD number two brought to life by the incredible storytelling skills of the talented T. Koa Washington. Immerse yourself in the captivating world of Laos as you embark on an unforgettable auditory adventure. Join us as you listen to CD number two unveiling secrets in this ancient kingdom and transporting you to a realm of wonder and enchantment. Get ready to be mesmerized by the rich history, vibrant culture, and breathtaking landscapes of Laos. It's truly a heart-pounding journey as this captivating audiobook takes an exhilarating twist from the pages of the novel Ancient Kingdom of Laos. So get ready, sit back and prepare to be swept away by a story that will leave you on the edge of your seat keeping you hooked from start to finish. And now without further ado, a word from the author, T. Koa Washington. Thank you. I am so excited about disc number two because disc number two uh, gives us a further insight into a couple of tavern members, especially Ardonis. As a matter of fact, when Chuck, our reader, starts off, he's going to start off with the chapter Mi Hijo Ardonis, which is going to tell you a little bit more about how he grew up. And later on, we'll also find out how he wound up getting into the tavern, which doesn't happen to be from the same time period as he was born. Very interesting. Let's find out a little bit more about the ancient kingdom of Laos. Chuck? Two souls from two ancient worlds meet the indigenous village of Camps Trovia in Lao, but one is implanted with a seed of malevolence. Ancient kingdom of Lao, the age of vampire Blackshear. Ancient Kingdom of Laos, The Age of Vampire Blackshear Written by Tekoa T. Washington Narrated by Chuck Aitharaagas Mi hijo Ardonius One just principle from the depths of a cave is more powerful than an army. Julian Marti Perez, El Apostol de la Independencia Cubana. Uncomfortable is exactly how I would describe it, squatting among the others in the tavern pretending to be one of them. That means someone used to uncomfortable squatting position and accustomed to drinking, smoking, and roughhousing from the grounded position. I don't squat. I don't smoke. I don't drink. At least I have never done these things until I have been welcomed into this merry tavern. Suddenly, without ever having to do one of the customary tavern behaviors, I am a full-fledged tavern member, a part of the unfamiliar atmosphere. Each tavern member has welcomed me through the doors without hesitation and never once have they looked upon me as neither stranger nor foreigner. Earlier, when the first light of day played apart the night and I had first arrived, I had seen an elderly barbarian with strong features despite the wrinkles etched deeply around squinting, impassive eyes. The barbarian was preparing his long-stem Laotian smoking pipe. He had been squatting towards the corner of the tavern, inserting a small brown squishy-looking organic substance into the pipe's largest diameter. The aged barbarian pursed his lips around the opening creating an airtight seal which he could slowly inhale the sweet-smelling intoxication. The look on his experienced face epitomized. This is the best feeling man can ever hope to achieve. I have wanted to achieve that feeling. I therefore asked the timeless barbarian, by signaling rather than words, to sample his completed preparation. He grunts in agreement, passing me his precious treasure. Yet I feel like a fool, unable to get my lips to close tightly around the pipe's hole. Spasmodically coughing all the while, I have felt clumsy and embarrassed as I have noticed the tavern folk calmly and slowly inhaling on what looked like a similar pipe to the old man. Some are not inhaling at all. They are simply blowing out of different essence contained in their various shaped Laotian pipes. Frustrated, I decided to give up. After all, while I was growing up, my family felt this was something I should not do. 
Besides, despite the incredibly sweet aroma, the taste is something left to be desired, and one I cannot easily acquire. Coughing and almost choking in my initial inhalation, I leave the old man in peace. I squat in the corner beside a younger, thin Kemstrovian, and have been sitting here ever since. The moment the newcomer enters barefoot through the door, I recognize him through the haze of smoke as someone who also did not belong to this Kemstrovian sector. I cannot restrain my eye from resting for an instant on his face. He's sort of a brother, from what I can tell, for we both are outsiders who have made our way in. You can sort of sense those who share your differences as well as your similarities. He is different. I can tell. They can tell. Yet amongst the two of us, I will have to say that I shall have been considered the most suspect since I am not even Asian. That's right. There is no Asian blood coursing through my veins. There are no eastern roots for me to claim. I was and am a Westerner. Yet it is he who has been immediately looked upon as different. They hold him as both a curiosity and a fear. I am not even a passing thought that enter into their cranium. Yet how can they look at me at something other than what I truly am? My eyes are vibrant with bluish green, and they resemble not an eye in the tavern nor eyes similar to those amongst the local people. My hair is not bone straight as is the others. My hair is actually jet black, long and wavy. This is definitely not typical of the native people amongst me. My skin is olive like that of my mother born and raised in Spain. My accent is British, like that of my father, me papa, with a Spanish twang. It's so unusual the way this all goes unnoticed in the company of the others. I honestly can say that I don't know how I got this era in time. One moment, I was in England around the 1400s. The next, I was here in such an ancient and bygone era. I am traveller named Ordonius Man who came from the future, and I do not belong in this time. Somehow, this has been my papa's doing. He has delved into the practice of dark arts. It has been through his mistakes that I have been caught in the middle. I have been sent back in time where life has developed a step above the Neanderthal man. Neanderthals are fighters suffering and inflicting battle wounds, mutilations, torture and maiming, practicing cannibalism and blood rituals. This is a time where tribal families and socialization are the greatest importance. A time where man asks, what is my purpose in life? It is a time where men gather as they ponder the reasons for their existence. I come from jolly old England that in the 1400s was an eye and eye culture of independence and self-reliance. There has been not much room for humility or any form of dependence. We don't depend on God, and we definitely don't depend on each other. The beauty of interdependence has been lost as all try to find their own niche and their own way. I remember when I first learned of my papa's ways through the story told by my mother. One day, I took the horse and rode somewhere special to hide for a few hours from Uncle Cadfan and father. I was happy to have escaped their madness. I almost died when I suddenly heard the sound of footsteps shuffling through the crisp grass, kicking pebbles and loose stones along the way. My heart was pounding fiercely, for I was not ready to deal with the madness of my father or them. Uncles who were not really uncles, only men who were my father's best friends. To my relief, after some time, I heard a voice call out to me. Yet the voice was a friendly one that I was not hiding from. It was mother, and she was looking anxiously for me in the opposite direction of the others. Ordonius, where are you, son? Mi hijo. She was calling me in conspiratorial whisper. Her tone was strong, and as a child, I had pictured the sound being whispered so loudly that its vibrations bounced off every surface and echoed its location. Like the hind bell of the town crier, preparing to announce news to the public, the public, of course, being my father and uncle, and the news being my location. Por favor, contesta me! Please, answer me! 
This tray is way too heavy to be searching all over the grounds for you. Her whispering became a low-spoken complaint. I was growing nervous. She would give my position away. I just didn't want my father finding me. Ardonius, mi amor. Adonde estas? Where are you, Ardonius? Come here, mi hijo. That was it. Her whispers seemed to be like a trumpet's call or a rooster's crow. I could not allow her to continue to attract unwanted attention. I had to put a stop to this immediately. I know you're close by because Cabalito is here. Oh no, I thought. I had felt so foolish because I had forgotten that Caballito might still be nearby. Although I never tied my faithful horse to a tree, he always stayed nearby waiting for me. Caballito was a noble creature with a raw instinct and pure heart. He had the power to take me away from my everyday disappointments brought on by my father, yet at the same time keep me grounded in the present. The word for horse in Spanish is caballo. Our horse was called caballito, a term for endearment. I pushed aside some tree branches that over time purposefully had grown with my aid to cover a large hole in the ground. I poked my head out of the barely visible cavern's entrance. Mama, does the whole community need to know where I am? I said, eyeing her, as though she had lost all her marbles. Sorry, hijo, you had me worried, that's all. She shook her head and drew out a breath of air. She had that, what am I going to do with you, look in her eyes. I know you'd never miss a chance to anticipate my cooking, and it just seemed like you were gone for hours, mi amor. She laughed and then said, The power Caballito has to take you is incredible. He can take you to places you are unable to reach alone. And at times, this worries me, you. I just want to make sure you're safe, that's all. Drawing one of my childish quick breaths and giving a forceful exhalation, I rolled my eyes and said, No, father would never allow me to go too far. You have nothing to worry about. Ah, uh, so you say today, your highness. Okay, supper is served, young prince of mine, Ardonius. She had said my name with a sort of royal announcement, and it tickled me to hear her say it with such flair. I was no prince, but I was certainly her prince. She never failed to tell me so. I was already halfway up the pulley, intricately designed to pull me into and out of the cavern. Two huge boulders in the upper traverse marked the entrance of the cave. As I made my way up the pulley, I was taken through a wide opening surrounded by surfaces that were separated layers of varying sedimentary rocks reaching all the way to the ground. This was called a bedding plain. Since the cave was formed within sedimentary rock, limestones made of compacted seashells, one soil layer visibly terminated, marking one age of deposit. Mi madre, my mother Valenciana, was my best friend, so I met her immediately to help relieve her of her culinary load. She got onto the wooden board operated by the pulley with me. She used the ropes of the pulley to lower us into the lake. The bottom of the lake had been well lit by me with torches. Seeing clearly was not an issue. Mother's eyes marveled at all she saw before her, and I was so proud of myself. I had just let her enter into my world the one I redesigned. She had never before been here, and I was so thrilled at the wonderment on her face. Then another sore lawyer began marking the beginning of another age of deposit. This continued as it angled about 40 degrees downwards, reaching the bottom of the cave. The spectacular beauty of this place never ceased to amaze me, and I could see it was a stunning sight for my mother. I must admit, the cave was breathtaking, and my very own living museum of natural history. Descending the cave via pulley was no less impressive than the ascent. At the bottom of the cave entrance, further passage took cavers like me to the lower levels, which were accessed via pitches and climbs. One passage that was not very narrow easily leads to what I referred to as the Dream River. This river of dreams was only able to allow me to reach two miles into the cave because a boulder had fallen, blocking the rest of the way. I could, therefore, only dream of what was beyond the river, perhaps a waterfall, 
or maybe a hidden land of limestone's labyrinths, where bioluminescent insects such as glowworms rode upon the backs of bats, having electrifying subterranean adventures. I had decorated the bottom cave entrance some time ago, so there had been a sleeping area, a table, and an area to sit, and my raft made of bundles of flax stems to traverse the underground river. How did you get here? We are far from where we live. I was truly baffled by her ability to travel so far with the food in her hand. Her left brow raised in fraction, and she nodded slowly as a little smirk magged at her lips. She said, You took Cabalito, so I had no choice but to take the raft. By water, the cave is only a few minutes away. You knew about the cavern. I was utterly outraged and feeling utterly betrayed. The cavern was my secret hideaway. That out of guilt, I finally chose to reveal to my mother. Yet according to her, she had known about my retreat all along. Hijo, I know all about you. Que clase de madre seria si no se donde esta mi hijo? She wanted to know what type of mother would she be if she did not know where her son was. Yet it was not a question, but a wearing not to debate with her. When my mother was making a point that she wanted me to know I had no say to argue with, she would speak in Spanish and never translate. This meant her statement was final, and no backtalk regarding it would be accepted. My face tensed and she loosened her gaze upon me. Relaxing, she said, I know you hide from your father. A strict parent makes los adolescentes varones that are tricky and slippery and will run the split second they get the chance. Yet sneaky adolescents have equally sneaky mothers that can find you at a moment's notice. This way, we can catch up to you and undo the damage of you giving a strict dad by planting lots of kisses on you. She grabbed my face and covered it in kisses. Pushing her away and getting her off the subject, I asked her about her meal. What do you have to eat? Hope you enjoy it. It's a specialty me madre used to make when I lived in Spain, you know? Mom had pointed out to a ceramic dish on the table filled with a rich, sweet, buttery, intensely tomatoey good treat. It was a smooth, creamy mixture garnished with a sprig of parsley placed next to a plate of soft, sweet, savory oat biscuits. Are you serious? Sweet oat biscuits? Now I've heard it all. Oat biscuits being eaten inside the remarkable subterranean domain would have been any young man's idea of having your cake and eating it too. Yet it was my cake, and I was definitely eating it too. Yep, I baked them fresh myself, mi amor. I know you love my oat biscuits. The meal was meant to be eaten cold and not warm, so everything tasted just right. I had my little own stone place to sit and eat. There were comfortable boulders for both mom and me. During my era, the ability to sit on stones, logs, or even falling branches was comfortingly ubiquitous and much more appealing than squatting amongst the Catrogans. What dost thou say? A tale, mayhaps? My mind to me a kingdom is. Such present joys therein I find, that it excels all other bliss, that earth affords or grows up kind. Though much I want which most would have, yet still my mind forbids to crave. No princely pomp, no wealthy store, no force to win the victory, no willy wit to salve a sore. No shape to feed a loving eye. To none of these I yield as thrall. For why my mind both serve for all? I see how plenty sure feet soft, and hasty climbers soon do fall. I see that those which are aloft mishap both retin most of all. They get with toil, they keep with fear. Such cares my mind could never bear. Content I live, this is my stay. I seek no more than may suffice. I press to bear no hefty sway. Look what I lack my mind supplies. Lo, thus I triumph like a king. 
content with that my mind both bring. Some weigh their pleasure by their lust, their wisdom by their rage of will. Their treasure is their only trust, a cloaked traft, their store of skill. But all the pleasure that I find is to maintain a quiet mind. My wealth is health and perfect ease. My conscience clear my chief defense. I neither seek by bribes to please, nor by deceit to breed offense. Thus do I live, thus I will die. Would all did so as well as I. Sir Edward Dyer The longer Ordonius squats down in the smoke-filled tavern, he notices his limbs becoming heavy, his mind lethargic, and his hunger drives are reduced. The inhalation of sweet vapors in the tavern seems to ease him into tranquil joy. Ordonius ruminates over the stranger's own melancholia. Studying the subtle white scars on his dark face, and the traces of silver in his tringy mane. He observes the man take a deep breath of pain that reveals the anguish of all his emotions. In the exhalation the traveler took, Ordonius imagines he alone understood the true reason for the barbarian's generosity. He wants to drink without conflict, settling into peace amidst the warmth of the tavern. Ordonius' soul cries out for the barbarian's soul as he weighs the wisdom of approaching the stranger. This man, who seems to be an unknown brother from another mother, seeing this pain triggers his own anguish. Light-headed, Ordonius imagines that he needs him. He wants to embrace him and do something that will surely bring death upon his door. He wants to cling to him and weep. But everyone knows that the moment you step outside your safety zone and venture upon something different, you run the risk of collapse, unless you are a hunter, a killer and a human beast, yet you live each day without making any waves or casting stones into the water, creating no disturbances upon the lake of your life. Then you pray to your deity and thank that supreme being for granting you yet another day of harmony. These profound thoughts are continuously singing and dancing around his mind. He is not so far gone that he has not recognized that to approach this barbarian will mean that he will have to step out of his protective comfort zone. He will have to dare himself to step out of the safety net of his existing life and into the proverbial blazing fire. That is not an easy task for a man not born a savage or familiar with barbaric brashness. Therefore, unable to relinquish his hesitancy, at first, Ordonius only studies this beleaguered giant alongside Fang Un and the others. He does this for what seemed like hours ticking slowly, slowly, ever so slowly by, as the instrumentalist played and Fangum engages in conversation with Manisuk. Ordonius' insufferable waiting in actuality only amounts to mere minutes as he watches this barbarian through sips of his lager. But in his state of mind, time seems to lose meaning for him. He is waiting and trying to discern if it is the company that the bloke so desired, or to sit in peace, so he may remain his own mental judge and jury. It is hard for him to tell because the barbarian has drank merely with the tavern folk. Then, everyone went their way, leaving no one willing to approach the generous stranger. Ordonius is a foreigner to this land and is only used to the customs of England, where once men share a drink, conversation is struck, and stays the entire time blokes occupy the tavern. At times, the visitor gazes upon the stone tavern walls near several barbarians at full squat. Other times, the foreigner seems to marvel at the palpable sense of history within those time-worn walls. Occasionally, Ordonius fiends having no interest in the barbarian by staring out the single glassless window, affording only a view to the world outside, which serves no security or insulation. At the snow-covered land and the brilliant, early morning sun punching through the dark skies. His vision is fading, as the light seems to mix the colors he sees. Distinct figures melt into shadows, and everything he looks upon had a sparkle to it. He imagines he is in the heavens, and everything feels and looks really good. He can't stop smiling. Finally, Ordonius gathers the courage, and he rises from his squatting position. He has been squatting so long that when he stands up, he stumbles, and his hazy state makes his walking both kind of difficult for him and simultaneously hilarious to onlookers. 
When he regained his footing, he boldly invades the space the barbarian so tensely occupied. Ordonius places a hand upon the surprised barbarian's shoulder, making his first wave into the calm waters of his life. High on life, he attempted to mimic the call of a Camstrovian, yelping rather than howling. Arf, arf, arf. Having neither the gruff nor brute force found in a barbarian's voice, he sounds more like a raspy child pretending to be a pup. Not surprisingly, Kayoin, for that was the dusky barbarian's name, does not respond. Instead, he casually moves his shoulder from under Ordonius's hand and makes a guttural hawking sound in his throat, shoots a thick pool of spit at Ordonius's bare feet, missing them by inches. Like the wolf, he marks his territory. The warning is out. Do not cross this pot. Thus, the proverbial fire igniting Ordonius's comfort zone has also begun. Ordonia smiles loopily at him and walks in the opposite direction of the warning mark, to the other side of Kyoin's shoulder, and then to the carved chair facing him. He then plops down and courageously makes a request of this unknown twin brother of sorts. What say ye to a tale mayhaps, comrade? He asks of the stranger, yet the stranger does not reply. He hears him, but a reply is not uttered. Ordonius cannot be sure of his attempt to make the Camstrovian call has come out as an insult. This worries him, for his request is formed not to be entirely nosy, but from the knowledge that, in the earliest times, savages have frequently gathered around for tales of life leading to death, and death followed by life. The difference between a mere gathering for talk and listening to a tale is really a large matter. It is like the difference between the undrinkable saltwater seas and the freshwater rivers that quenches one's thirst. Talk is a sea whose waves come crashing along the shores of Kandur, eroding all truth along its path as it picks up gobbledygook and deposits debris inside its endless belly along the way. Talk often moved aimlessly and idly, without fixed direction. Most Camstrovians avoid the sea filled with meaningless talk. But tales told by a Camstrovian are from the heart. They tell of a desire to lead by wisdom and example. Tales are welcomed because they are like a meandering river leading to experience and a series of destinations once known. At length, the stranger appears to rouse himself from some private reverie and fixes Ordonius in his steely gaze. Surprisingly, the visitor responds to Ordonius' earlier remark about sharing a tale. I be far too weary of bone, mind, and spirit for telling tales, he says in a voice that reflects that weariness. I am called Kewin. With that, he grunts and turns away, signaling to Ordonius that he wishes to be left alone. There is no barbaric, knee-jerk reaction to being snubbed because Ordonius is mellow as he floats on the sea of life. He recognizes the man's name as being Laotian for God's gracious gift. Hmm, Ordonius thought. So, this barbarian is Laotian, just as the others in the tavern. This barbarian is a true Camstrovian with curiously long limbs and bronzed features. Ordonius' bold approach of the bronze man has startled everyone including the young robust Fangu. As Ordonius demonstrates an act of bravery that shames all men of alleged courage in the tavern for they have accepted his drink but still they keep their distance as they inwardly pass judgment. Until that moment, Ordonius has been unnoticed. Now he too poses a different sort of threat to their livelihood. Until that moment, his presence in the tavern has not caused the same apprehension and colossal curiosity at this barbarian before him. To them, he looks altogether too civilized, even erudite, and therefore unworthy of true men's attention. He is beginning to reason that perhaps it is the unspoken opinion amongst the barbarians occupying the tavern that this bringer of trouble will go back to his homeland if he were welcomed as a mere nobody. For savages knew that those from other lands with flashy tongues were bringers of destruction to their people's ways. Therefore, unlike the bronze barbarian Hitherto, Ordonius represents an ugly virus they prefer to stir clear of. Unlike the bronze man, who represents an unknown kinship amongst savages. At least, these are Fang Um's thoughts. In fighting his own reservations, Ordonius becomes braver than all the savages in the room. 
who have considered approaching this newcomer but have been unwilling to engage in a possible confrontation. In fanning out the flames of his own reservation, he also becomes a player in the game of survival of the fittest. How odd to encounter a bronze-skinned man in this frigid climate, Ardonius thinks. Dusky men in these parts are rare. It is only logical that the man has either a mother or father not born from Laos. Yet, Ardonius is not willing to cast stones into the lake of life, only to dip his toes and make waves in the water. Emboldened, Ardonius ignores the stranger's entreaty for solitude. What me, Keowen, he says. I am called Ordonius. Hum, the other grunts in typical Kamstrovian style. I come from ye far land called Spain. Um, the man says, barely pretending interest in what Ardonius has to say. I've lived most of my mortal life in a country called England. I'm here to this land away from my kin in search of answers, and these answers do not come readily to me. May I ask from whence thou came, brother? Your name is Laotian. Shall I assume you are from here in Laos? Kaywin looks down as his eyes lower in a sort of surrender. Since the birth of Earth, man mistakenly thought his little corner of the world is how the entire continent is governed, except in the disaster land of Kamstrovia. Most men never realize that scattered individuals have their own peculiar social customs and political systems. Though the men here are savages, they know that there are places that are governed by strict laws. They understand there are men that will not live nor die by the sword, but rather by words written on parchment. Gra'um! <clears throat> Kaywen grunts in a voice that sounds as if he has been speaking to himself rather than Ardonius. Arr! I traveled from the direction which lies, er, uh, directly ahead of each Kamstrovian facing the setting sun. He tells Ardonius. It is an inconclusive remark that does little to provide understanding. His facial muscles tense, and he breathes hard as he continues. Um, I traveled many sunsets across frozen steppes. I came across nothing save a few tiny villages. Plonk, with a wild grimace, his massive right fist smashes hard on the tree stump table, knocking his tankard perilously close to the edge. Urgh! The growling cry is followed by swish, plank, and splash, the sounds of the tankard being assaulted by his left hand and swept onto the floor. Off whence I came, I do not recall. Kaywin, I am, but how, I do not know. Is such a thing possible? He demands as he reaches a massive hand behind Ordonius' neck and forcefully yanks him forward. Though Ordonius does not wrench away, he does draw back, wincing slightly in pain. To quench my thirst, I long to sip from the fountain of memory. Kaywin exclaims as Ordonius attempts to stand. The barbarian's grip is unrelenting. The man glares into Ordonius' eyes with a hard and defiant gaze as though he may will an explanation about the cause of his predicament from Ardonius. When Ardonius' own puzzled look and closed mouth offer no words, the barbarian exhales with a noisy sigh. How is he to know that Ardonius' puzzled look is more of a question aimed at him? Instead, Kaywin begins to tell Ordonius the things which lead up to him and Ganesha finding the tavern. As Kaywin recounts the events leading up to this tavern, Ardonius, for the moment, tunes Kaywin's words out and focuses on his own thoughts. Ordonius has hoped the barbarian might telepathically comprehend that he wonders if their situations are the same. Ordonius, too, cannot recall something, but it is not about who he is. Ordonius cannot recall how he has come to be there amongst the camp's Trovians. Yet, he is fully aware that this is especially troubling to Kaywin because a man without a tribe or a family is a man without a purpose. Just as the wolves set out to hunt and bring the food home to the family, so did the Kamstrovians. Most wolves live in packs, a community sharing daily life with other wolves. Such was the fate of the Kamstrovian. Though the cavern was filled with testosterone, true life of ancient Laos was about extended family and community ties influencing the barbarians' daily life and responsibilities. 
The tavern is merely a watering hole stop before a hunt. The community is the sacred place, giving the barbarian and his family security. This place is where families get their balance and energy to maintain their spiritual, physical, and mental health. Though the tavern was a refuge away from their daily world, fact remained that the bigger, the stronger, the tougher, the more independent-looking the barbarian, the more likely he went home to the comforting traditional rules of his wife, mother, father, grandmother, and or grandfather. From whence we came. One of the effects of fear is to derange the senses and make things appear different from what they are. If thou wart in such fear, withdraw to one side and leave me to myself. For alone I suffice to bring victory to that side in which I shall give my aid. Miguel de Cervantes, Don Quixote de la Mancha, Part 1 Fear is sharp-sighted and can see things underground and much more in the skies. Miguel de Cervantes, Don Quixote de la Mancha, Book 3 Mama and I sat with fingers, grabbed and ate vegetables, dipping them in the oat biscuits into the sweet tomato treat she prepared. Thanks, Mama. This truly is a meal fit for a king, not a mere prince like myself. My tone was sarcastic, and we had such fun laughing at the tiny little joke. I loved to hear my mother laugh. Inside the cave, she sounded as though she were a delighted bird melodiously singing her notes ever so high, rather than laughing. I mean, I know I have been acting like a royal pain instead of a prince, but I thank you for being so kind and patient with me. Then there I was, the picture of a kid whose mother had him wrapped around her finger. My mouth was stuffed full of one of the sweet butter biscuits, and I was grabbing onto my mother, hugging her as though she were a cuddly teddy bear. Artonius, it worries me that you are a tan triste. So sad. What bothers you so, amor? Mother often inserted Spanish into her sentences to constantly teach me both languages. She did not want me to forget the language of my heritage. Father did not speak Spanish. Therefore, the only time I was exposed to Spanish was around my mother or when we traveled to Spain. It feels like a silent storm inside of me, Mama. I think back to when I first began to see Papa cry. Mama, he screamed out. Why had I to be born? It frightened me. Mother reached out for my hand, and as she held my right hand to hers, she said, Mi hijo, es tiempo. It is time to tell you of Mother Nua and Father Pangu. She smiled, pulling my head down to her lap, stroking my hair as she reached for an oat biscuit with her free hand. Dipping the biscuit into the tomato-like sauce, she completed her chewing and said, Did your father tell you of Mother Nua? She asked me, but she knew he did not. It was always her polite way to give me a chance to disclose what I knew and to uncover just how much I wished to learn. Como? What? Madre Nua? I replied my tone filled with great interest, for I had heard that name before uttered by father. Yes, Io. Nua is a deity who came from the death of Pangu. Su padre, your father, is certain she is as real as you and I, Io. Su padre says that she is the first creator of humankind. El Midite, he tells me, that she is a powerful benefactor to people and all living creatures. My mouth had hung open in astonishment, but I never uttered a word. Instead, I lay there on her lap, staring blankly up at my mother who was trying to let her words fill me up and offer some logical understanding. My mother was my best friend. My mother would never and had never lied to me. I knew in my heart her words were all the truth. I saw the pain in her eyes as she spoke to me. Yet, I found it incredibly hard to believe that my ridiculous papa had bought into this mere folktale, legend and mythology. She continued in hushed tones, as though she were dispensing a secret. I never liked secrets. I felt secrets were ways for people you care about to force you into biding meaningless things from people that also cared about you. A terrible cycle that I never could agree was warranted. Yet, secrets were the way of life no matter how much I felt. Secrets were just another form of lies. She lowered her voice and said, Su padre learned of the goddess through a forest age or strong seer he had met one day while hunting wild boar. 
he told Papa, your father, that he was a druid, that the druid beliefs were not written on parchment, and there were no records of their teachings. They considered the written word profane, and instead spread their gossip through verbal communication amongst each other. He told to Padre that the reason he had never heard of the goddess was because it was told to those whom she needed to believe. So Papa was told that he was the chosen one destined to spread the word and believe. He, along with Sustios, your uncle Sedvan, Ores, and Kentigern began to meet the sage once a week for continued enlightenment. My eyes rolled up in a complete understanding. I had seen my uncles hanging around a nasty looking older man. He sent shivers throughout my body and I definitely did not get good vibes from him. But I never could get close enough to him because my father would forbid me to follow him or my uncles during their private meetings. Madre mia, is that so wrong? I asked with inquisitiveness, raiding my brain. No, mi hijo, hay ninguna falta en esto. There is no fault in that. As with all things, su padre brought his teachings to me. So Papa told me that most people believe that Adam and Eve were the first of all humankind. There was no creature in the world at the beginning of the Genesis. However, there was. He was meeting with that forest sage to discover the origin of Eva. After all, nobody ever asked where did that nasty snake in the garden come from. I bolted upright. The origin of Eva? I asked incredulously mortified that anyone would even want to consider this something worth finding out about. See me, hijo, she said as she rubbed her thigh, trying to gently cycle out of stiffness from where I previously rested. Mi hijo, the conscious mind cannot truly conceive of a world that has no beginning. Think hard on this. No matter how I tell you about the first plant and animals, you will always wonder how they were created. Then if I tell you of the Creator, you will wonder who created him. It never ends. You always will wonder how it all started. The sage told your papa that long ago, when heaven and earth were still one, the entire universe was contained in an egg-shaped mist. All the matters in the world swirl chaotically in that egg-shaped vapor. The stunningly picturesque swirling cosmic egg contained the origins of the first conscious life. There in the cloud you could also find all the miraculous oppositeness known today, yin and yang, masculinity and femininity, darkness and light, etc., all contained in the universe, all wildly unbelievable cosmic matter, she said. You mean that good and evil were both part of the same space package? My mother laughed, and it had all the warmth and love of her homemade traits with milk to wash them down. She was delightful. She replied by saying, Yes, but good did not know how to be good, and bad did not know how to be bad. They just coexisted and were happily contained with each other. Eventually, after many thousands upon thousands of years, all this matter, the yin, the yang, the light, the dark, all the polar opposites shifted and spontaneously gave birth to a cosmic deity called Pangu. So how did this Pangu look? Was he like us? I had to admit, mother had my full attention. And besides, I loved the way she told any type of story. Tales of how she met my father, and fantastic tales of a life in pain. No matter the subject, mum had a way of making events sound fresh and exciting. Ah, mi hijo! He was surely different because he was unique. He was the first of all conscious matter. The very first, mi hijo. That makes him unbelievably beautiful no matter how he looked. Yet nobody ever told one version of how he looked. So many people over the centuries have told such different versions of his looks and that it's hard to hone in on the truth. Some say he has two horns, two enlarged teeth that look like walrus tusks, and he was very hairy as a woolly mammoth. Others say that his back was like the shell of a tortoise. He had legs like an insect and his eyes were the color of the deep blue sea. The temples of Pangu worship in China and the country of Laos. However, have well-kept cultural artifacts depicting Pangu as a huge fire-breathing snake with lizard-like legs. Each temple in both countries shows the mystical appeal of the colorful magnetic bands of light and particles colliding around Pangu. Your father says to hear the sage speak of it was in itself undeniably breathtaking. 
So, was Ban Gu a giant? Mother laughed and said, Hi, Mi Iho. You are right, my son. He was indeed an oversized giant that grew in the chaos. You are right. Actually, for 18,000 years, like a caterpillar waiting to become a butterfly, he underwent his metamorphosis inside this vapor. Finally, one day, thousands of years later, he awoke from his misty cocoon and stretched out. This caused the cosmic egg cloud to burst and disperse the glorious matter of the universe. The lovely lighter, purer elements drifted upwards to make the sky and heavens. Leftover was a powerful, more prone to lingering matter, yet no less attractive than the more buoyant matter. This heavier debris contained impure elements, which slowly settled downwards to make the earth. Pangu was transformed from a giant being into a massively long creature, a dragon. Mom's eyes popped out wide as she said the last words hoping to shock and scare me. Yet it did not work. Instead I said, Just like that? Bang? See, si, one big bang, mi amor. Was the dragon good or evil? I questioned my mother. Neither, my child. That dragon was born from a cosmic balance and was incapable of being either. However, when the lighter particles floated up and the heavier debris fell down, he instantly felt the allure of the opposites. It was the most unreal feeling imaginable. Pangu liked the separation and did not want the light stuff be called heaven and the heavier stuff he called earth to mix again. It was then that he made the choice to use these magical gifts, to hold them as far apart as he possibly could. Shouldn't have that been easy? I mean, light does not want to be with dark and good does not want to be with bad. It all seemed perfectly logical to me. Ah, mi hijo es la verdad. It is true. However, back then all was perfectly balanced, coexisting in just the right harmony, longing to be a part of the other. The child of the universe, Pangu, however, had a strong determination to end unity by pulling those balanced forces apart, creating a tension that the world was not born with. He took things out of order and rearranged it in ways it was not meant to be. This created an element called confusion. Pangu was not bad or mischievous. He was simply a lone deity in the world who could do as he pleased. To create confusion was interesting. To keep things the same was boring. I guess I had to find something to pass the time. There was nobody to talk with and nobody to tell him right from wrong. So he did something instead of nothing. Kind of like me in a way. I have no brothers and sisters. Dad won't let me speak to other boys outside of church. If I sat all day doing nothing, I would be bored too. But instead I explore my cave. But I don't get it. How did he separate the forces? I said as I wondered aloud. That's actually a wonderful question. He placed the heavens on his head and the earth under his two dragon claws. He thought of them as his toy? As I asked with a childlike awe. Uh -huh. As a cat with a ball of yarn. He unraveled and continued to separate what he called Earth from Heaven. Pangu allowed himself to stretch impossible lengths until the heavens were unreachable from the Earth. He managed to separate the peace that he was born with from the chaos he longed to have. Have you ever wondered why so many people long to go to Heaven? Or why others are having pain mixed with guilt, anger, and regret make a better drink, the taste of which takes years to wash out of their mouths? ¿Cuál es esa bebida? What is that drink? I don't remember tasting anything so awful. I felt confused and unsure of what she was referring. The drink is called hell on earth. It is what people naturally gravitate towards, and some cannot escape the bitter taste. She spoke the words, but my mind immediately thought, like my father? He gravitates towards misery and self-loathing. She continued unaware of my thoughts and said, Pangu separated the beautiful matter that floated upwards. Heaven from the sinking matter, hell, then voila. She said this as though she were a person with tricks up her sleeve. Here we are living on what was left in between, on this green earth. We are drawn to either direction because it's all supposed to be a part of us. Fortunately for the world, our wonderful Pangu had to eventually stop. The act of growing exhausted him and eventually he perished from the unrelenting stress and strain. Really? I asked incredulously. 
picturing the whole bizarre event in my mind. Oh, see me, Amor. The temples in Laos and China alike depict images showing that with his passing, the earth began to develop into the world we know today. His reptilian arms and legs became the four directions of the mountains. His blood became the oceans, and his sweat became the rain and dew. His voice became the thunder, and his fiery breath became the earth's core. The air from his nostrils became the wind, his wild hair became the grass, and his veins became the rivers and streams. His teeth and bones became the minerals and rocks, and his flesh became the soil of the fields. Up above, his left eye became the sun, and his right eye became the moon. Thus, in death, as in life, the mighty dragon Pangu made the world as it is today, she said. My skepticism was rising. Hmm, what he did could not be undone? No, this is why so many people feel as though there is something more to this life of ours. Deep within us, we know there has to be more than we are experiencing right now. We sense it. We are on an unknown quest to put the pieces Pangu separated back together. My unease caused me to shift on top of the rock I was sitting on. I hesitantly said, Yeah, I do feel that way a lot. When I take my raft down through the waters of the cave, and I think I am meant to be doing or seeing more. There is more out there, right, Ma? More that I need to discover? Aha, mi io, she said, beaming with fervent delight. I think it's time to tell you about the fact of life. You see, son, we want unspecified things to be all around us, including ourselves, but we can't seem to always make it happen. There are times that we start to feel like we are failing. So we blame others or ourselves for all the tribulations we face. However, what people fail to realize is that we have fallen apart from something much greater than their mind can conceive of. She paused to look around the spectacular cavern we were in, with its impressive surfaces made of limestone, which housed water drip formations that were hidden from the world above. She also told me that what we can't imagine was even greater than the things we saw before us. Ordonius, it is a fact of life that we often have conflicting desires within ourselves, Mi'io. As humans, we don't always get to do the things we want to do, much less the things we think we should do. This is not unusual, my son, for even the king wishes to be something bigger and better and greater than he already is. People feel like we just don't have what it takes, whatever it is, to reach our desired goals, she sighed. Her soft tone and gentle spirit eased my nerves as she explained everything, yet I was still confused. But it doesn't make sense. A king is already great. What more could a king wish for? You do know he has all that money and power and desire, don't you? I asked. How she could make such an example when everyone I knew wishes he could be a king or she could be a queen. Perhaps he wishes to be a conqueror or even greater than that, Eo. Maybe he settles for this position because he feels he cannot reach any higher than that which he already has. Perhaps he even fears that with all his enemies and those wishing to usurp his position that he cannot hold on to his royal title for long. He may toss and turn at night hoping that he lives to see yet another day as king. So therefore, how could he dream of being a conqueror or more when he is not even secure in his own skin as king? Little do people realize that they often easily crack under their own imagined pressures. Why do they not push themselves a little more? Why do they not trust that there is nothing in this life? No hay nada en esta vida, which is not there for any man to accomplish? We play victims to vague worries and anxieties, and because of this we easily feel we are not in control of our own lives, giving us a sense that there has got to be more out there for us. Nonetheless, we don't feel we possess the ability to obtain it, she said. She took her first bite of a roasted carrot she brought with her. She didn't want to say it, but it was all over her face. So, I came out and said, Those carrots are the best. They're so good with a sweet, crisp taste, Mom. They are exceptionally delicious. She took two more bites of the pride of her harvest and then continued, I don't want to strain from the topic because these things are important for you to know. Listen, Ordonius, if you feel that you have reached all your goals and you still don't feel satisfied, 
It's possibly because you are indecisive and no confias en tu instinto, meaning you don't trust your instincts. Worst of all, the passion of your true discovery will elude you, making it so you cannot feel whole or satisfied. It's important to always remember to trust your instincts. Confia en tu instinto. Your father says that the unnatural separation of heaven and earth is why we mess up our relationships with others. Even though that's not our intention, it's the reason we are confused, uncertain, and prone to make mistakes, she said. Yeah? So why does father not fix his mistakes if he knows that much? I was being a wise one with my comment, but she simply gave me that all right enough of that look. Mother continued. I believe that we have the tendency to rely on the self so much that we alienate important kinfolk in our lives, you. Even with those we love, we tend to be excessively competitive to the point of a me-first attitude, to take things personally, and to be impatient, rash, and impulsive at the expense of our own personal happiness, driving us off the path of feeling in line with the heavens Pan Gu pulled us away from. The situations you face in this life all comes down to you, Io, not your father. What are you willing to do to bring about a happy ending? Your energy is resonant, making you the key player in your own life. Yet, never be overly self-reliant and set in your ways like your father. Never cling to your earthly possessions and habits. I am not saying that you must be like the friar and live a life of poverty and simplicity, uttering sermons in a loud, albeit sweet, melodious voice to announce to the faithful that it is time for the obligatory prayer and to invite them to give you food and clothing because you would be forbidden from asking for cash. No, I am simply saying don't become obsessive over your possessions. Never be fearful of crisis or overly focused on your security and never attempt to achieve positive outcomes through sheer will rather than listening to your sixth senses. When you learn to align yourself with the universe, then you will attain a Pangu-like inner balance. It's built in us, Mi'io. The longing to belong and never quite feeling as if we belong is feeding our uncertainty. The more things you surrender to that ugly green spirit inside you called fear, the more things you will be afraid. Este espíritu malo es la razón siente el miedo. Fear is crippling. Her body is contorted, shaped to best distract you. She shackles those who could do great things and keeps them from even attempting that which they could possibly achieve. Fear will choke you, mi hijo, and kill your dreams and creativity by summoning you into a state of panic. Today you may be only worried about only one thing, tomorrow about two things. And the cycle will not end as she presents you with all the possibilities in which you will fail. And then, mi hijo, Soon you become so emotionally involved in fear's ability to paralyze you that you have no identity. ¿Qué podría ser más terrorífico? When we, when we as a people rise to achieve balance and harmony, the earth will again gravitate towards the heaven, and we will be where we belong. Debo confesar que me ha visitado. Fear has come to me and grabbed my mind in sort of chokehold, then strangled it as she played upon my insecurities. However, the monks of my church says it's important to say at least three prayers for everything you do during the day to achieve balance and peace. Even if I am deciding how long in the cave to stay, I should pray repeatedly for God to explain all the world's events. Is this why we must not feed into uncertainty? I asked knowing that the monks taught that my salvation would come only if I strictly follow the church's teachings. There is nothing wrong with the church bell stalling the eight sacred hours calling our people to worship, and warning us of the dangers of our spiritual defilement. Remember, mi hijo, fear who lives inside us is also a part of our emotional sins. Fear is made up of a whole system of sins that include worry, anxiety, insecurity, and self-doubt, all which take away our ability to let God act inside our heart. Where fear lives, God cannot do His magical works. For fear kills faith. So we use those joyful sounding bells, because only when we are no longer a friend of fear, we do begin to really live. The bells are reminders to follow our devotional book of hours during those specific times in a day. We are called to worship because the church is the center of our important community activities. 
It is where all our religious services are held several times a day to help us achieve spiritual balance and shed our sinful ways. We do pray, yet so often we find theology irrelevant to our lives regardless. I know you do not strictly follow the teachings of the friars or monks, Mio. Born of wealth and privilege at times, you bribe the poor monks and friars, shirking your spiritual duties and run off to the caves, she said. My eyebrows raised and my head shook vigorously from left to right, cracking up the wheels of my mind. As the gears of my brain began to work, the doors of my mouth opened and my tongue raised. Yet before I could utter a word, my mother raised a finger from her delicate right hand to stop the denial forming on my lips. She gave me a look that said, Don't you dare. With a single finger, she had stopped my gears that were in motion causing the lie waiting at the tip of my tongue to retreat into the depths of my sinful soul. You need not protest what I already know to be truth. Ordonius, something in us wants to believe even when we cannot completely agree to follow. It's because we know that there is more. We were meant to be a part of. We may not follow completely because we do not feel free when we follow. Yet, by not believing in something with all our heart, we will never reach that something more until we all strive to create inner balance. What Panguan did can again be restored, but only if we each align our ways with that of the universe, she said. Valenshana, my mother, looked at me for a long time, took another bite of her carrot and said, Now, mi hijo, do you know the history of Madre Nua? She took my right hand into her left and looked at me with warmth that made her seem like a vision of hope unto itself. No, I have no idea. I had to admit her words had me a bit shaken. I think I was taught to see why father had believed the forest sage. Nua is a deity born from the death of Pangu. For centuries, Nua enjoyed earthly walks through empty plains and valleys on the earth. Only two other supernatural beings dwelled in the world. One was, and to this day still, is omnipotent, put quite simply Mi'iho. He alone has all power over all things, at all times and in all ways. He is the strongest of them all, so naturally, he dwelt above in Pangu's heavens. The other deity rules the underworld at the very center of the Earth's core. He is a deity quite pleasant to look upon. However, he is capable of casting uncontrollable dark desires, which leads to suffering. He is the antithesis of enlightenment. Isolated inside the original breath of the dragon, a sickness from the fire elements grew inside of him. The numerous toxins from the magma rendered the deity diabolical and quite cunning and petty on his nature. It is as you have always said, Mama. A handsome lad who is pleasing to one's eye is good only for frightening the deer when he stumbles unwittingly into the dark forest without food in hand. My mother looked into my eyes giving me a knowing look, a look that says, you know of whom I am speaking, don't you? Mother always said that I was blessed with good looks, but with what? But with that was a responsibility to never act in vain, for if I ever got in trouble it would be my brains, not my looks that would help me escape. The forest reference was meant to let me know that a deer, bird, rabbit, or other herbivores would run at the first sight of me, no matter how good I looked. It also meant that most animals that preferred meat would not care if I were cute as button or as disgusting as a rat. To them only my insides would be important. She then continued, Después de algún tiempo, for a time, the goddess Nua being the only supernatural being who wanted to live upon Pangu's earth, eventually grew tired of her lonely strolls. Pangu's separation of earth and heaven created a world of uncertainty and unbalance which eventually seeped into Nua's pores. She developed a dismay of standing alone and no longer found satisfaction in being on her own. She wanted children, Eos, to giggle and play with. She wanted a couple of cute little ones like you, mi amor. Without warning, mother grabbed at my cheeks and began pinching them pink. My cheeks were too old for such abuse, yet even at that age, which was about 15, my mother could always make me blush. I remember biting an enormous chunk of the oat biscuit and shoving it down my throat to avoid the embarrassment. Mother laughed and continued her account. Perceiving that creation was very desolate and lonely, she began to craft living creatures from the earth's clay. On the first day, el primer día, she created chickens, 
game birds, ducks, and fowl, and sent them cuckling and pecking throughout the world. That had received a mighty laugh out of me. Mother continued as she herself chuckled with me. On the second day, El Segundo Dia, she fashioned turtle doves, wolves, elephants, and other animals to be scattered throughout the forest and lands. Durante el tercer día, during the third day, she created flowers, some of which bore fruits for other animals for other animals to graze upon. En el cuarto día, on the fourth day, she crafted insects to pollinate. Durante el quinto día, on the fifth day, she made whales, fish, crustaceans, streams, rivers, and lakes. On the sixth day, en el sexto día, she was inspired and crafted horses. Finalmente el séptimo día, finally on the seventh day, she was walking near a river, and she saw the beautiful reflection of the omnipotent deity from the heavens. She was delighted, and it struck her that she would make man in the image of his deity. She knelt down in the golden clay and began to hand sculpt figures similar to this beautiful deity. As she set the lovely little forms down, they came to life and began to call out to her, saying, Mother Earth, we need you. All that day, Nua molded more and more of these children. Because she never personally met the deity of the heavens, all her children appeared different in features, but still made in his image. After her long labors, her energy was waning. To finish the job, she picked up a strand of ivy and dipped in the fecund mud. Then she flicked the mud across the lands. Everywhere the little blobs fell. People sprung up, coarser and less lovely than the handmade folk, but perfectly serviceable. Thus did Noah create humankind separating from the very beginning the rich and noble people from the commoners by means of her crafting methods. This is silliness, Mama. How can such a thing be? I protested. I had a feeling she was talking to embolish the story just a tad. Laugh not me, Io, for this is what Su Papa now accepts as truth. So I asked my mother, Y tu, Mama? Do you have faith in this as well? My mother looked sad and she responded by saying, I trust in your father's love for us. Mi hijo, how wrong could it be? After all, su padre tells me that Nua loved her creations, and she looked after them in silence. She was modest and never needed acknowledgement or effusive worship. This is why for centuries, no word was ever written about the goddess. Now, you must recall that there were two other deities around the time she was making her creations, one who dwelt high above and one who dwelt deep below. Her tale had me enthralled and thinking about it now makes me truly miss my mother more and more.